Hey guys, Ross from Hack Perception here. Great to be back. I'm really excited today because we've got someone who I've been trying to pin down for a long time. He's a very busy man and rightly so. He's a man of many talents. I'm here with Charlie Morley today to talk primarily about lucid dreaming. Charlie, it's great to have you here, man. Great to be here. Thanks, awesome. man. Awesome. Um, we've got lots that we want to cover as we try and do on Hacked. We've, we try and get a really broad spectrum of things in our interviews. So. What I wanted to start off with is kind of a base level, really, and ask you the question, what is a dream to you? What does that, what does a dream mean to you? Wow, what is a dream? I think yeah. you're going to ask what is a lucid dream. We're going to start nice. with what is a dream? So nighttime dreams, right? If we look at nighttime dreams as the succession of visuals, thoughts, concepts, illusion mm -hmm. that are mind brain seems to create when we shut our eyes and go into some aspects of sleep this could be dream mm -hmm. but far wider and nicer to explore is kind of the concept of dreaming in the waking state because mm -hmm. if we think of the dream that we have when we go to sleep right as we go to sleep we close our eyes at a certain point our brain goes into slower waves and mm -hmm. begins to kind of shut down somewhat and then another point it reactivates Mm -hmm. And suddenly our brain is creating an internally generated illusory reality. And it is a reality because we mm -hmm. think it's real. We think dreams are real once we're in them. It's only yeah. when we wake up that we're like, oh, I'm clearly not the Queen of Egypt. Yeah. But when we're having that dream, we're the Queen of Egypt. That's our reality. Totally. We feel it. We accept it. People are treating us like the Queen of Egypt. We look like the Queen of Egypt. For that moment, that's become our reality. Mm -hmm. So to say that lucid dreams are any less of a reality than this is to miss a trick. Mm. So perhaps we can look at the waking state in similar terms. And from a Buddhist point of view, of course we do. It's seen that the primary illusion, the primary dream is this shared dream of waking life. Mm. And the dreams we have at night time are actually referred to as dreams within dreams. Mm. So when we get lucid, fully conscious in our nighttime dreams, that's secondary actually to the main point of practice, which is to get lucid in this dream. To wake up in, and in see world, that, yeah. yeah, and wake up, see, oh, I'm not the Queen of Egypt, or I'm not Charlie. Yeah. I'm not Ross, I'm something more. I'm actually intricately collected to everything in this dream. Mm -hmm. You know, once we get lucid in our, you know, the dream of nighttime, we get lucid and we say, oh, I'm not really the Queen of Egypt. I'm Charlie having this experience of the Queen of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And all the courtesans, or I don't know, whoever hangs out with the Queen of Egypt, suddenly mm -hmm. aren't separate. They're one with me. I'm one with the notion of Charlie asleep in bed. I'm one with the notion of being the Queen of Egypt. And I'm one with everything surrounding this mm. illusion of, of being the Queen of Egypt. Now, if we could have that in the waking state, this would be awakening. This would be a realisation, perhaps. Yeah, so I guess to kind of take it back slightly, um, the, the dream concept, I guess, there's been the, you know, the, probably most people are familiar with the kind of Freudian and Jungian analysis of dreams yeah. in that traditionally it's about kind of I don't know you know rep repressed emotions and things that are going on in your your waking life and it's the subconscious trying to you know do mm. something with that and then as you kind of alluded to as well there's a kind of wider kind of spiritual perspective of what is dream and what is reality is it the same thing kind of stuff um I guess we've, we've kind of preempted it a little bit but then one of my questions was going to be about Buddhism as well, because, you know, it's something that's clearly a, a huge part of your life as well. And what does what does dreaming mean in, in the Buddhist context? Yeah, great question. It's interesting. Within Buddhism, there's very little uh, emphasis on anything like dream interpretation, mm -hmm. because it's seen that the dreams at night are dreams within dreams, that to spend a lot of time looking into illusion within illusion is to kind of miss the point. Yeah. So in fact, Dalai Lama has been quoted saying, if you ask what the role of dreams are in Buddhism, what their point is, we have no answer other than their potential use as a training ground for spiritual practice. Mm -hmm. So he's indirectly saying, really the only major use for dreams is to recognize our dreams through lucid dreaming and to use that as a training ground for awakening. Yeah. You do have a little bit of dream interpretation in Buddhism. In fact, in Tibetan medicine, there's loads of dream interpretation. Mm -hmm. You get very specific things like uh, if you dream of, oh God, 
what is it? I think some, if you dream of riding naked on a donkey backwards, this can be a sign of uh, impending illness or something like that. You know, very specific things. Okay. But within Tibetan Buddhism itself, yeah. you get things like being high up, it seems to be good, like moving upwards in dreams is positive. Yeah. Uh, food in dreams is, is positive. You know, okay. being fed, it's about spiritual nourishment. Yeah. But you don't have any kind of dream dictionaries in, in Tibetan Buddhism. Right, okay. Um, but, yeah. of course, you do have a whole science around how to get lucid in the dream. Yeah, and, and is, you, you mentioned specifically Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah. Is, is the, the kind of dream yoga stuff is that is that unique to tibetan buddhism or is, does that appear in other forms of buddhism as well do you know interesting tibetan buddhism has taken dream yoga really to the fullest level mm-hmm. it's created a real science and practice around dream work and, and dream yoga and lucid dreaming mm-hmm. you do find dream work in other traditions of buddhism in fact buddha himself is quoted in the uh, pali vinaya which is kind of like a uh, like a rule book for the monks mm-hmm. and nuns two and a half thousand years ago, in advising his followers to fall asleep in a state of mindfulness. He's not directly using the term lucid dreaming, but he's saying fall asleep in a state of mindfulness. And the reason for this is to avoid uh, negative dreams, Mm -hmm. uh, so like nightmares, and to avoid dreams of omission, which basically means wet dreams. (laughs) So he's telling these monks, look guys, you don't have wet dreams, fall asleep in a state of mindfulness, then you won't won't go kind of down that path. So you do find practical applications way back in the dawn of Buddhism. But really, the school of Buddhism that that created science around it is, is, is primarily Tibetan or Vajrayana Buddhism. Okay. Um, and again, we're kind of bouncing around. It's, it's difficult to kind of do this in a linear way, which is kind of you know relevant to the whole concept, actually. But um, for for those who don't know, what is a lucid dream? How would you define a lucid okay. dream? Yeah. So a lucid dream is a dream where you're consciously aware of the fact you're dreaming as you're in the dream. Mm-hmm. So it's not just a really vivid dream, yeah. but sometimes people think it is because of that term lucid. Yeah. It's not a perfect term, actually. You know, it should really be called conscious dreaming, mm. because what defines lucidity is conscious awareness. The term lucid actually connotes uh, clarity, clear seeing, vividness. So sometimes you can have really vivid, really clear dreams, but it doesn't make them lucid dreams. Yeah. Lucid dream, you're sound asleep, you're, you know, you're snoring, you're drooling, yeah, you're yeah. out for the count, but inside your mind, and actually there's a neural correlate to this in the brain, part of you has woken up yeah. and is going, aha, I'm dreaming. My mm-hmm. body's asleep in bed, but you're right now aware. I'm in an yeah. illusory construct of my mind's creation. Mm. And that's super cool, I think. It is, I think it, it's a fascinating subject and a fascinating experience to have, I think. When you, when you can realise in the dream that you've, like you said, that, that awareness and that awakening, that you can look at these things which are seemingly separate from you and this, this incredible construct and it's all behaving its, its way yeah. it behaves. And then you realise that's all you. Yes. You know, and how, that's it, how incredible is that? It's Absolutely. just amazing. Um, so... I guess what we're kind of getting to is saying, what is the difference between the dream and, and the waking reality? Is there one? Are we actually saying that it's the same thing? Well, we've got to be careful. It's not as simple as life is a dream, mm. but it is life is far more dreamlike and far more empty of an inherently existing reality than we believe it to be. Mm -hmm. It is closer Closer to a shared dream than what we call reality. I mean, kind of waking reality in in scare marks, you know. So it's not literally that you would become, if you were to reach full spiritual awakening, you'd wake up in a bed on another planet. It would act, I mean, this is why the lucid dream is such a good metaphor for awakening because, I think, because in a lucid dream, when you become lucid, you don't just disappear. Like right now, if I became lucid, bam, oh, I was dreaming about the hack perception interview. This wasn't, oh God, this is a dream. So it's, it's the night time, I'm still in bed, my fiance's next to me, right, this is all a dream. I don't disappear. The hack perception interview actually still continues. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> but, <laughs> but what changes is there's a huge shift of perception. Mm. I see that who I thought was separate from me, Ross, is actually me. Yeah. I'm like, whoa, that's my Rossness in front of me. And at this table that I thought was separate from me is actually my tableness. This is perhaps a, a symbol of my, um, uh, my support 
of my yeah. something that, that that can hold that can that can support weight. You know, it's a table. Mm. Suddenly, you see that everything's you, but it's still there. We don't disappear. We don't kind of float off to the astral planes. No, we keep having the interview. But in fact, even doing it, the notion of the interview changes now because I realise it's it's, it's just, a dream interview. It's just you. Yeah, yeah. and that you're yeah. me. So yeah. any kind of separation, I'm like, oh God, does he like me? Does he not yeah. like me? You know, I don't know him very well, but I just drops. And I'm like, mm. that's my Rossness. Yeah. And it's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. And even just saying it as an imagination actually changes the energy right now. So it's quite fun to do as an experiment. Yeah, I think it's just the, I guess the, when you realise the, the fluidity of the dream state when you, when you become awake is a kind of, it's potentially, you can even look at it kind of metaphorically and you can say, you know, this, this is a tool to achieve something or mm -hmm. this, is, this is metaphorical to how I shouldn't, you know, get wrapped up in emotions and all this thing in my, in my waking life. Or you could perhaps even take it extremely literally and say that should one become awake enough, then you... Is there any reason you couldn't manipulate this reality? That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> if you look at um, if you look at all the uh, let's call them tales or or stories of people who've done miraculous things, like you hear about these Tibetan yogis who can mm. walk through walls, fly through the sky, appear in two places at once. And of course, my other traditions as well, absolutely. It's just the stories in my mm. head right now are the, are the Tibetan ones. Those aren't random miraculous events. Those are just the kind of things that me and you can do in our lucid dreams. Yeah. It seems that the lucid dream state becomes a laboratory for enlightened action, whereupon, if one were to become fully lucid in this dream, you would have the same level of yeah. interaction as you would in the lucid dream, i.e. the ability to fly, walk through walls, appear in two places at the same time. It yeah. doesn't make it any less, I mean, total Harry Potter, oh my God, this is madness, I don't know yeah. if I believe it, but it, it, it shows there's a through line there of logic. If we could perhaps become fully lucid in this, then yes, we would have that same level of, uh, of influence as we do in the lucid dream, yeah, apparently. And I, th I think this is kind of the, the one of the broader topics that we're trying to, investigate and tackle throughout the whole of hack perception the fact that we're investigating traditions and science and mm. religions mm. And, and psychedelics and you know all different avenues of understanding what is reality and consciousness and as you said there is that was the whole sort of inspiration really to, to start hack perception was the, was the idea that there is this kind of thread that mm. runs through it all and if you look at those kind of, you know, wisdom traditions, forefronts of science, other, you know, consciousness ex explorative practices, it, it begins to seem less crazy, you know, on the, yeah. on the front of it, it seems crazy. But then when you actually think about it, you go, well, you know, maybe, maybe it isn't, you know, maybe that, that is all of reality. Yeah, you know, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, and that it's totally okay to live in that paradox of both opening to a possibility and staying securely skeptical in this yeah. yeah you know one of the first teachings of buddha was take nothing i tell you as true so you find it as true yourself mm -hmm. so to be skeptical is to be buddhist yeah. you know people think oh you're supposed to be buddhist you're supposed to be open it's like open-minded yeah to, to facts but questioning but yeah. questioning constantly yeah. and not cynical but skeptical mm -hmm. so we can we can acknowledge a possibility absolutely without yeah. having to totally buy into that possibility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, bills have to be paid. This table's solid. Yeah. You're separate from me right now. And yet at the same time, I can hold in my mind the possibility that this is 99.9 .9 to the 13 recurring empty space, <laughs> that me and you are made of stardust yeah. and that we are one. And we can hold that at the same time and it's yeah. okay. No, it's, I it's, think. No, I don't think it's, it's fascinating. Um... <laughs> And I guess again we're we're kind of just moving sort of backwards and forwards on this, but I guess why why Buddhism for you? How did you find start first off actually? How did you find Buddhism? And okay, um, I remember being attracted to kind of Buddhisty things from really young. Mm -hmm. Like I remember when I was ten, I used to spend my pocket money on um, joss sticks. I used to go up to my room and light them and do this weird, almost like a ceremony thing. I'd light them. 
and I'd kind of waft the air in my, the smoke in my face. Hmm. I don't know why, I guess part of me was hoping I'd get high or something, oh, yeah. or maybe get high of drugs. but part of me, this they felt something natural about wafting this smoke, so strange, and drawing yin yangs on stuff when hmm. I was really young, I don't know, but, but really, uh, when I was about 15, I started to get interested in lots of things at the same time that all move towards Buddhism. Mm -hmm. One was um, Shaolin Kung Fu from listening to a lot of Wu-Tang Clan hip hop. Yeah. Now, of course, uh, you know, the early Wu-Tang stuff has loads of samples of the old school Kung yeah. Fu movies. So suddenly Shaolin, what's this? Start going, asking at school, mm -hmm. of course, pre-internet, so school library and stuff like that, picture books. And uh, so Shaolin seemed cool. Yeah. And then I started getting interested in kind of uh, martial arts anyway. So that mm -hmm. pushed towards Sha oh, Shaolin monks. Yeah. They're super Warriors, hard, but they're yeah, Buddhist yeah. monks. So Buddhism's suddenly cool again. Yeah. <laughs> Wu-Tang think it's kind of cool. They think it's kind of cool. Um, and then I read this book called Sophie's World um, during my... A like year before my GCSEs, yeah, about 15. Mm. And, um, I mean, Sophie's World is a complete head fuck of a book. It's beautifully head fucking, in fact. It's like a book within a book within meta-awareness of, uh, of the kind of bigger author's mind. It's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And, uh, but essentially, it's about a girl who has lessons from a philosopher. Mm. One of those is about Buddhism, and the Buddhism bit really stuck with mm. me. So that kind of pushed towards it, and then I was getting into lucid dreaming and... Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of weed to smoke, man, and a lot of crazy <laughs> parties to go to before it stuck. But there was an yeah. interest around 15, 16, then two years of pure carnage, like mm. 16, 17, 18, while I was kind of getting into Buddhism. And then 19, I decided to take refuge, to stop drugs, to go veggie, mm. to shave my head. It was like an extreme turnaround. Yeah. Um, and of course, there were, there were mon months of struggle, but essentially, then when I was 19, I decided mm. this is it. This is... This, this, this is fear. Of, yeah. yeah. No, it's really, it's interesting again as well, the, just again, the connectivity and the, and the path to things as well, which is kind of similar to my own in a way as well. Martial arts was one of the first things in Shaolin yeah. and, and Kung Fu. Ah, I started brilliant. out in, you know, like Wing Chun Kung Fu yeah. back in the day. Um, and, you know, I've always been fascinated by the Shaolin. And it, it was kind of the same thing with, with Buddhism, thank you. Um, and, and do you... Although you would say, you know, Buddhist uh, practice is your is your kind of main area now. Do you mm. do you have an interest or do you do you study other, um, you know, belief systems and traditions or are you kind of purely, you know, on the on the Tibetan Buddhist path at the moment? My path may be purely Tibetan Buddhist, but that doesn't negate and in fact necessitate mm -hmm. the, the study and awareness of other religions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm particularly interested in Gnostic Christianity. Mm -hmm. So this is the early form of mystic Christianity that my good friend Tim Freak wrote a couple of books about, The Jesus Mysteries, mm -hmm. uh, The Laughing Jesus, this kind of stuff. So I'm interested in that. Um, also Sufism and their dream practice I'm interested in. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's usually the dream practice that gets me into it. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in the new book, there's a, a little section about uh, Islam and, and dream practice in kind of... Uh, Orthodox Islam and stuff like that. So often the dream right. stuff that gets me into it. But no, yeah. very open to that. And uh, uh, shamanic cultures, especially of this land, you know, the shamanic mm. cultures of the British Isles, yeah. um, interest me. Because mm -hmm. although I'm into Tibetan Buddhism, I wasn't born in Tibet. I was born in this country yeah. where the dominant religion of my upbringing was Christianity. Mm. It wasn't Buddhism. So I think I owe it to the karmic link that's brought me into this body to be aware of Christianity, to be aware of the shamanic roots of this land, mm -hmm. to be aware of Wicca, of paganism. Um, but yeah, for me, my, my practice is, is Tibetan Buddhism. Cool. Um, so I guess, without going, you know, it's, it's probably something that we could go off and, you know, just do an interview talking about this. But what I wanted to ask you was, from your own experiences with, you know, obviously a lot with lucid dreaming, mm -hmm. How far have you been able to take the lucid experience? And what I mean by that is we've, we've talked about things like we can fly and we can go through walls and we can do whatever. Have you got to the, the point where you can manipulate the, the fabric of the dream in, in sense of like structures and the space? And also have you gone, I guess, a stage further? And I don't know if this even is... is is relevant within within this conversation but the kind of astral projection kind of stuff mm -hmm. 
Have you had any experiences of those kind of things? Interesting. Okay, so um, just working back from that point, I wouldn't actually put astral projection as a step beyond lucid dreaming. Mm -hmm. I'd put them as branches on the same tree and have a great interest in that, yes, and a practice in it. But I think actually, for most of us, or for myself, definitely, I have so much work still to do in the lucid dream world, which is, from my point of view, primarily within your personal mind state, whereas astral projection is part of your mindset accessing a universal mind. Mm -hmm. I've got so much stuff still to work through my personal mind state that, for me, lucid dreaming is in many ways even more beneficial than the outer body work mm. because I'm working with this. I'm working with my mind, my neuroses, my habits, my karma. Mm. Of course, the outer body stuff has one huge, huge benefit with it which is that it proves to you beyond doubt that you are not exclusively limited to this physical form. Mm -hmm. You are habitually limited to it. It is out of habit that our energy body stays fixed within this. Mm -hmm. But through certain practices, you can move out of that habitual uh, clinging and move into something where your energy body can separate. So that's absolutely mm -hmm. brilliant. And I I love OBE work and I do the Monroe Institute courses. My good friend Luigi, who runs the UK Monroe stuff. Um, but I found that the lucid dreaming practice is so, it's such a revelation in our own psychology. You know, to be able to meet your fear, mm. literally to call out fear, come to me. And a mass of energy, or sometimes in a personified form, will appear. And you can converse with your fear like I'm conversing now, is is so transformational that I could be there for a thousand lucid dreams before yeah. I find pulling out my body, looking back and going, oh, look, there's my body in bed next to my fiancé. Wow. Mm. Which is a, a level that often OBEs get stuck on. Yeah. Uh, we kind of look back at the body and we think, you can look at, you know, <laughs> we're stuck in that thing the whole time. When, when we shift out, don't be stuck in the bedroom. You go for it. Yeah. Explore the astral plane. Explore the other dimensions. Um and then to work backwards on your question about the, the kind of level of lucidity, it's funny, it's in the books I talk about these levels of, of, of fully lucid and then super lucid. Mm. And in the level of full lucidity, yes, you have full ability to um, direct, choreograph and influence the dream at will. Mm -hmm. I try not to use words like control and manipulation simply yeah. because of the energetic baggage that those words connote. You know, kind of control is about domination, subjugation. If you want true control in your lucid dreams, don't try and control the unconscious mind. Make really good friends with it. If you can really befriend that dreaming mind, then yes, you can go into the dream and you can put your hand out and you can go apple, boom, banana, boom, yeah. little man, boom, and these things will just appear, the ability to manifest yeah. at will. But you can get lost in that head trip. Mm. You can feel like you're God in there and think, and, and people get stuck at this stage. Believing that full manifestation in the dream, full control, is, like the, is the aim. Yeah. And it's not, man. And mm -hmm. I got stuck there for years in my kind of early 20s before I started to teach. Now I realize a level beyond that in this super lucid state, which is where we move beyond the act of dreamer and dreamt, and we move into a union between the two, where we realize what's the point of making things appear out of thin air and doing this kind of magic stuff. It's a bit like the, the growth of shamanism, actually. Mm -hmm. Moving out from low-level magical shamanism into that higher-level shamanic union with the elements. So in a super lucid dream, the level of connectivity with everything in the dream is such that you stop doing many things. You actually just go in and fully open yourself to this experience of oneness. And when that occurs, the kind of bliss state that you enter into so surpasses any pleasure state that you might get from the ability to walk through walls, do great things like talk to your yeah. fear and meet your inner child and stuff like that is brilliant. But the level beyond that, you realise there's nothing actually to do except just be in union with it. the space. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's, it's really interesting that because it's like a, like you say, it's almost when you start to explore that realm, you're kind of in the mindset of saying, okay, now what? Now what can I yeah. do? Now what can I do? Now yeah. oh, I've, I've, I've mastered this, so now what, what can I push the boundaries with? What can I just do something even more ridiculous and fantastic? Yeah. But I suppose, again, it, it all relates back to the, those kind of, that Buddhist mentality and mindset and being of just being, yeah. not, 
not poking it and playing with it and yeah. attaching to it. Absolutely. And yet, I should mention, there are very specific Buddhist practices you do to help you get to that stage. Mm. So you go into the lucid dream state, you start reciting a certain mantra associated with a certain yidam. So yidam, we could think of as like archetype. Sometimes mm-hmm. referred to as deity, which is confusing. Yeah. Yidam, actually, the Tibetan word yidam means uh, mind connector. So like green tara, for example, is the mind connector of feminine enlightened energy. Or she could be called the archetype of feminine enlightened yeah. energy. So in these certain practices, you'd go into the dream, recite the mantra of the certain yidam, mm-hmm. visualize, and of course visualization in lucid dream is to manifest, because it is yeah. visualizing. So visualize the deity or the yidam archetype in front of you, and then transform yourself into the yidam. <laughs> so you would look down, you would actually have turned into the deity or yidam while you're reciting the mantra. But all of that is to get you to that point mm. of absolute being. union of moving beyond the dream. Yeah. So there are skillful means engaged, and it is that we do something, but there, it's doing this to get us to the point where we don't have to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? It sounds, it that, sounds funny, but... Well, it is. It's that kind of... Not just in Buddhism, I guess, but in most kind of wisdom traditions in martial arts in so many things where it's you have to kind of you have to kind of learn first and and do first and then once you've learned and and done you then let go exactly yeah you know it's almost like it's like the bruce lee thing isn't it you know the you know the punch is a punch it kicks just a kick it's it's that strange paradox of having to do something and then and then you let it go and just let it be yeah um which you know is Beautiful, the way, you know, wrapped up with, with, with the Buddhist, you know, ways. We've, we've talked a lot about Buddhism, and we've talked a lot about kind of wisdom traditions and things like that. Clearly, and from what I've seen from, from your, your books and the, the way you speak about things, Buddhism is obviously, it's, it's your path. And, and, mm-hmm. and, but one doesn't have to be Buddhist to, to lucid dream, of course. No, not at yeah. all. So it's a, something we can all do. Yeah, and hopefully yeah. the stuff in the books and the way I teach on workshops and stuff is in such a way that you don't have to be Buddhist to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I try and in some way, well, I'm not try, I'm definitely inspired. I try to be like, but I'm, not, I'm nothing like, but I'm definitely inspired to, to try and be like my teacher, Rob Nen, who is a Zimbabwean-born meditation teacher um, who presents mindfulness meditation in a way that is accessible to everyone. Mm-hmm. But... He is absolutely teaching, at some stages, quite high level Tibetan Buddhist meditation techniques. Mm. But he's not using Tibetan words. He's yeah. not using Tibetan iconography. He's talking a language that everyone can understand. And when I see him teach, I feel so inspired. I think if I could do that with lucid dreaming, you know, if I could offer people the full on energy of that dream yoga tradition and lineage of which I'm in some small way part of, but not have to give it the weird Tibetan words and use silly terms like, you know, the Colombo method. There's this, there's technique I teach called the Colombo method. Mm. You know, if you ask my teacher, Lama Yeshe Rinpoche, um, Charlie's teaching us the Colombo method, he'll go, Charlie's a little bit crazy. I yeah. don't know what Colombo method is. You know, I have no, yeah. no idea. But if you say the Colombo, what the Colombo method is, which is taking time to explore the dreamlike nature of reality, Mm-hmm. And allowing that to bring us into a different state of mind, he'll say, yes, this is dream yoga practice. Yeah. So this is what I'd like to do, to be able to offer stuff that still has that full power of lineage. Mm-hmm. Not, not the kind of, not the watered down, sometimes watered down Western techniques that get people lucid and then say, now do what you like and go and fly and meet movie stars. Mm-hmm. But actually has this, this... The guidance, I guess. Yeah, the guidance and the, mm-hmm. the connection of that of that, you know, thousand-year-old Tibetan Buddhist practice. Yeah. But you don't have to be into Tibetan Buddhism to do it. Exactly. Hopefully. Exactly. And I, I think it, it begs that, that kind of wider question around not just the practice of lucid dreaming, but just awakening and spirituality and religion and God and the universe and all of those things mm-hmm. anyway. And I think it's a question that particularly, I don't know, particularly in the, the sort of modern age that, is a is an important one to us because mm-hmm. I think so many people are, I don't know, they're, they're they're trapped in the the dogma and the methods and the traditions and the practices and they're and they're fearful of it. They're fearful of I don't know cultism or mm-hmm. being bound 
to mm-hmm. something. And quite topically, you know, the, the Stephen Fry conversation, I'm sure you've seen that, yeah, you know, bouncing brilliant. around the internet at the moment. You, you know, what is God? And, you know, how does that, does that relate to an atheist? Could an atheist, mm-hmm. you know, Lucy Jeeman, of, of course, you know, they, they should be able to use in, using the right um, practices. But from, from, from your perspective, what would be your take on the kind of, I guess the bigger picture, the kind of universal model, the archetypal God concept? What, what are your feelings and, and beliefs around that? Well, I guess that as, as a Buddhist, theoretically I'm atheist in that Buddhism doesn't believe in a creator God. Mm-hmm. But it does move towards a divinity in all things. That every sentient being has Buddha nature. Mm-hmm. Not only Buddha nature, but actually that every sentient being is already Buddha. Is already that divine being. And that there's nothing to do, actually, except remember. Mm-hmm. And we've forgotten. Yeah. Just like in the dream, we've forgotten we're dreaming. Yeah. And then we wake up and we're like, oh, God, I totally thought I was the Queen of Egypt. If we remembered when we were in the dream, we would have recognised. Yeah. And I spoke to my teacher about this, and he said, this dream's just a very long one. Mm. You know, you've been in it so long, you've forgotten there was a place to wake up to. Well, and isn't it the, also, just to, to sort of cut in a little bit, isn't it one of the things that I've often kind of pondered, and other people have, have spoke about it, is that the reason this one is so convincing is that there is an illusion of continuity in it. You know, if yeah. the... If the dream was continuous, who's to say we would even call it a dream? We'd just call it life if you yeah. just, you know, carried off at the next point. And there are so many central protagonists in this one too. It's not only yeah. continuous, but everyone thinks they're the central protagonist of the dream. Yeah. And in many ways they are, and yet they're not. You know, I'm no more the central protagonist of this shared dream than you are. And yet both of us kind of feel like we're the central protagonist in our own mm. dream. So it's this wonderful it's kind of paradox. Yeah. yeah. But the God thing, you know, there's a great quote from, uh, from Jesus where he says, uh, you will find me in every rock, in every tree, under every stone. Mm-hmm. And that, I think, is what I go for. Yeah. Is that actually there is a God, but it's not somewhere outside. It's not a creator. It's not a thing. It's a godliness. Mm. And it is in everything. Yeah. As much in this table as it is in you, as in that sound recorder, that everything is vibrating with this divine potential if only we could see it. Yeah. So in that way, there's absolutely a God. Yeah. And it's in everything. But also in that way, there's absolutely not a God. Mm. No, it is, so it's, 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 it's that beautiful paradox, yeah. isn't it? And I think the, I think the, the kind of trapping that a lot of people get into, particularly if they're kind of not necessarily open to... Well, not open, I suppose, is, is the simplest way to say it. That... Mm like the Stephen Fry conversation, they get trapped in the, the archetypes of the system or the structure and say, well, that's just ridiculous. That couldn't be, that couldn't exist. But if we call nature or the universe God mm-hmm. and say that, of course, everything has a divine element, the fact that it's existed, the fact mm-hmm. that it's, it's here, mm-hmm. then even though it's kind of paradoxical, I think it's a it's an easier thing to even though it's vast it's almost like an easier thing to accept and say I must believe in this deity and this deity mm-hmm. looks like this and said these things mm-hmm. and so I think it's just whatever you know whatever path you choose it kind of leads to the same place in a way it doesn't really you know definitely um so so we were just kind of talking around the, the kind of bigger question of the, of the universe and God and kind of divinity and what we were just sort of discussing was it doesn't really matter what path you choose they're all kind of leading to the same place is, is what we're... yeah I think they probably are all leading the same place I think there are massive diversions of route to get there yeah. and one path goes up a bloody mountain the other goes under yeah. the ground the other goes through the sea massive yeah. massively different paths for the massively different mind states that we all have mm-hmm. and yet 
to be a complete path, yeah, I think it is all leading to that state of that realization of oneness yeah. and that that movement towards mm. love, for want yeah. of a better word. But I don't think that means we should try to or want to move towards a kind of homogenization of no. stuff, like some of the new agey stuff is doing, where it's kind of homogenizing traditions. Mm-hmm. I think that actually gives, does a disservice to both traditions. I actually say, no, they are totally different paths. But yes, absolutely, eventually they'll reach to this, this point of oneness. Yeah. But they're different paths for different people, and that's beautiful. Yeah, and the fact that almost don't, yeah, don't try and water it down. Yeah. Just, you can take that path or that path and, the, and do it completely wholeheartedly yeah. and it will still give you that revelation or that, you know, wherever it takes Yeah, you. I believe that's the kind of, basically the Buddhist view on it. Yeah. Uh, because there's no, there's nowhere in Buddhism where it says it's the better path. Mm. You know, it says it is a path yeah. and there are loads of others. And of mm-hmm. course, the Dalai Lama's famously told people not to become Buddhists. Mm. He said, no, 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 if you're a Christian, if you were kind of born a Christian, you've been christened, far, far better to stay in your tradition, do mm. the practices, uh, than, than kind of leave and convert to Buddhism. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, the, the paths probably do lead to the same place mm. if, if completed fully. Yeah. Um, yeah, big, big questions, I guess. It's yeah, difficult. man. It's difficult. Two young yeah. men talking about God, eh? This is yeah, brilliant. It's, uh, it's, it's quite difficult to kind Who of... Who would have thought? Yeah, try and wrap this in a, a kind of order. But I guess the other thing I was really keen to speak to you about was we've, we've discussed lucid dreaming, we've discussed Buddhism, we've, we've discussed some of the bigger questions. And what I was going to ask you is, have you... Have you explored with like any other techniques of consciousness exploration? If so, what are they? And how do you find that compares to the lucid dreaming experience? Yeah, I've done a lot of drugs, a mm-hmm. um, lot of psychedelics, you know, acid, ketamine, mushrooms. I used to be really into that. That period I mentioned mm-hmm. before, that kind of 16, 18, uh, 16 yeah. 17, 18 hit that really hard Mm -hmm. Um, but that's because I couldn't get away from this feeling of there's got to be something bigger Mm. you know since I was 15 and started to get those inklings I realized there had to be something bigger than this and at that age the other routes to it that I now use like meditation and breath work and yoga and all this kind of stuff were just way out of my 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 range and way out of my discipline Mm -hmm. but I'd found that if you know, I took enough acid or ate enough mushrooms, then I would have experiences that seemed to support the inklings I was having, yeah. that there had to be something bigger than this. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't regret any of those experiences. Mm-hmm. In fact, it was a full on kind of drugs overdose I had when I was 17 that led to this near death experience that led to me really getting into starting to look at Buddhism more thoroughly. And what was that from? What drug? Um, it was ketamine. Mm. Um, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so, so I think I've talked about this kind of before. So um, uh, I was uh, 17 and uh, what I thought was speed was actually K. So I racked up like a cigarette line of, of, uh, of what I thought was speed. Yeah. And uh, clearly, uh, very soon, I realized it wasn't and it was ketamine. I didn't really know what ketamine did. Obviously, it's a... a, a, a this was a dislocative or dissociative. Anyway, it's a. Uh, it's uh, essentially a tranquilizer. Yeah, it? so it was yeah. tranquilizer. Yeah. It's like it was, was horse tranquilizer. I remember it was pirated in from a vet from India. And uh, anyway, so I had this uh, classic near death experience where my heart stopped, uh, tunnel, um, which had all these photos of me uh, when I was younger. And I remember being lucid in the, in the trip at this time, you know, total chaos, so no awareness of the waking world, but in this space as a point of awareness, and I saw these photos of me, and I remember thinking, oh, they're me. And I was kind of looking at the walls, oh, oh, look, it's me, I'm getting younger. Oh, look, there's me when I'm a child. Oh, look, there's me when I'm a uh, toddler. Me when I'm a baby. And then just a flash of fear, mm. I remember asking myself, what comes before baby? And it went, Whoom! and I'm in this huge, infinite void. I mean, it was black, but it wasn't black like because there was no colour. It was black because this... This was primordial. Mm. It was before colour. It, it, vo- it was just yeah, void. Yeah. This <laughs> huge void. And I'm just floating in there. No up, no down, no reference point. But with lucidity. And then this massive booming voice, which is my voice, goes, Charlie, do you want to live or do you want to die? Die, die. <sighs> Echoed. And I had this... Well, a lot of things happened very quickly. First one was I realised, oh, when you die, you realise you're God. <laughs> 
not like in an egotistical sense no, no. or not like the godly you realize you're but you one. realize that yeah. you're at the end of the tunnel there isn't the dude in the white robe it's you and the judgment if anything comes from you mm. but there's also an option or in this case it was an option because it was a near death experience it wasn't a death experience you know it was near near to death mm. um, and i remember just going live <laughs> and then i heard this noise it sounded like a drummer it went bum 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 Bum, 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 bum. And I was like, what the hell's that? And I was at my heart. Oh, and I was like, oh my God, it's my heart starting up again. And, then, boom, and I burst back to reality. And the people I was with are gathered over me. Because obviously, I'm, yeah. I don't know what I was doing. Freaking out on the floor. Or they'd seen that I'd blacked out or lost, stopped breathing or something. Um, God, and then the chaos ensued for the rest of the morning. And panic attacks. And yeah. massive post-traumatic stress nightmares after that for like four months. Getting to the stage where I was trying to keep myself awake all night. So I didn't have to go to college. Because... Then if I did go to college after nightmares, I'd get these like agoraphobic things where I'd lock myself in, um, not lock, but I'd go into toilet cubicles. It's very small and I felt very safe in there, but the wide space Mm. was very scary. You know, borderline psychosis. And I remember thinking, I have to tell someone about this, but I knew that if I told them about it, definite medication, possibly Mm. getting sectioned or something, you know, I was just really scared. But I was, by that time, I had a pretty good lucid dream practice. And I'd been reading all this stuff in the Stephen LeBurge books that you can use lucid dreaming to work with nightmares. Mm. And I thought, well, can you can you use them to work with really bad nightmares, like post-traumatic stress nightmares? Turns out you could. Easier said than done. Managed to get lucid in these recurring nightmares, but then I just bailed like four or five times on like the sixth time or something. Got lucid. R- realised that this figure in front of me who represented death. You know, the nightmare was I had never come out of that tunnel. The nightmare mm. was I was still in it. And so that thing appeared again, and I finally turned towards it. And I said, I see you. I fucking see you. You know, not very compassionate, but I was only 17. <laughs> I yelled it. The point was I acknowledged it as me rather than outside demon or, or, wow. or psychosis. Uh, and the dream changed, transformed into the 17-year-old's vision of paradise, a big skateboard ramp with girls in bikinis and guys smoking splits. You know, again, very low level. But looking back, and it was obviously my view yeah, of paradise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the nightmare stopped overnight. Four months, every single week, same time, same night, just stopped overnight. And I remember thinking, wow, this lucid dream stuff is powerful. And that's why I've always had a particular fascination and love to work with people who are working with post-traumatic stress mm. or nightmares. And I've worked with people who are in the, lady who was in the bus bombing in London, you know, and Al-Qaeda blew up the bus. Mm. I've worked with a um, uh, ex, uh, sorry, Iraq veteran from Glasgow, I came on the retreats and worked with his nightmares too. Because for me, the very genesis of my lucid dreaming practice was based around this kind of self-curative experience of working with nightmares through lucidity. So I love it when someone comes to me with, with not love it, but you know, I love mm. being able to help people if they come to me with post-traumatic stress or nightmares simply because I know it works. I know they can do it and I know it will change their life when they do it. Wow, man, that is powerful. I've literally got goosebumps when you're telling that story. That is, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> Thank you for letting me share. Dude, incredible. Um, and it kind of leads on very nicely to what I was going to ask you next, which was about, you. we've clearly talked about a lot of them, but it was about the benefits and importance of lucid dreaming. And you've clearly, you know, it's, it's changing people's lives. It's helping people deal with post-traumatic stress and many other things, I guess. Yeah, but you're but brilliant. But let's look at some of the, uh, uh, how does it grow corn bit? You know, I often talk about this. I think it was Stanley Krippner who was, who was shared the stage with at Gateways of the Mind. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said he was asking shamans, uh, you know, why they use lucid dreaming. And they found it amazing that people in the West were using lucid dreaming just for kind of fun. Mm. And he said any spiritual practice in this particular shamanic tradition was used to grow corn. And what this was about was that the shamans were having out-of-body experiences, lucid dream experiences, not just for fun, but they would go out of their body float over the or kind of fly over the local terrain and say oh that's where we should plant the corn next year so it had a very utilitarian mm. uh, reason very for doing practical. yeah very practical reason for yeah. doing obies so i like to call this the kind of does it grow corn bit and you know does lucid dreaming grow corn what's the point mm. um like i said nightmares exploration of consciousness um one of the quickest the most direct way is to enter into a state of oneness that often people talk about and you think well what is it what is really that feeling of full interconnectivity and also a a more basic level um being able to heal both Mm. physical and mental trauma uh for example mental trauma let's say you're scared of spiders Mm -hmm. you can go into the lucid dream state work with your phobia 
because the brain switches or part of the brain, the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex switches back on when you're lucid, that means in a lucid dream, neuroplasticity is engaged. So it's not just like a normal dream. In a lucid dream, you're actually creating new brain pathways. Yeah. So if you can fearlessly interact with, let's say, a spider in your dream, mm. you will actually, in the waking state, be less likely to be afraid of spiders. Yeah. Um, physical healing, I've worked with ear infections, torn scapulas, uh, as I've said uh, a lot on videos, and I used to wear glasses and work that to get three lucid dreams, but seem to work through short-sightedness, right. through lucid dreaming. Uh, the healing is working in a very similar way to the way hypnotherapy is working. Mm. Uh, hypnotherapist will guide an element of your conscious mind into the subconscious, plant a statement of healing intent. Let's say you want to stop smoking cigarettes. The healing intent would probably be, I live a healthy lifestyle. You wouldn't even mention the cigarettes. They, they would be negated in, in the suggestion. Lucid dream are doing a similar thing, but rather than being in the shallows of the subconscious, you're going to the depths of the unconscious, simply because you can't get more unconscious than asleep. It's not, it doesn't mean it's better than hypnotherapy. It just means it's a slightly different modality. So yeah. if you plant a suggestion there, by literally calling out to the dream state, engaging in a visualization of whatever it is, it's going to work with very, very um, high efficacy. Mm. Uh, possibly even more so when compared to hypnotherapy. And I say that with complete, complete respect uh, and a, a couple of years training in, in the uh, hypnotherapy too. So yeah, healing, psychological yeah. healing, physical healing, working with nightmares, um, having fun, asking for advice. You know, you can go into the lucid dream and literally ask for advice. Yeah. There's a... A friend of mine in the new book, she went in and said, what should I do career-wise? She saw this vision of her surrounded by little kids reading books, um, took this to mean something with working with kids, ended up taking a job, uh, applying for a job to be a primary school teacher. The night before, she has another lucid dream. She asked the sky, should I take this job in the dream? The sky spells out in stars, Y-E-S. The next day, she applies for the job. She gets it. Her life has changed. You know, it's just... The stuff you can do with this makes me want to run out, run out on the street and, and grab people. Like, Have you heard about lucid yeah. dreaming? It's free. Yeah. It's one of the most deeply beneficial healing modalities available to us. And you do it in your sleep. I mean, yeah. this is nuts. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it asleep, is. you look like you're doing nothing from the outside. Inside, you can be creating new habits of mind. That's brilliant, I think. It's incredible. And I think the, the, the thing you mentioned about the actual... the Not just the... I guess the, the 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 mental and emotional well-being element, but the very physical element that is actually affecting neural pathways yeah. in your brain. I didn't know that about lucid dreaming, and it's very similar to the the you know what these psychedelics do as well. You know, the mm -hmm. psilocybin and DMT that's actually breaking down physical pathways of addiction yeah. and opening up new things. Really interesting. I think the the point you mentioned as well about you can do this in your sleep, right? So people say, I haven't got time. Yeah. How much time do we spend sleeping? Yeah, like you know, a third of our lives, right? 30 exactly. years. And if you can be doing something yeah. so healing and useful in that, what, what, an, amazing, what yeah. an amazing thing to do. Yeah, a third of your life back. Yeah, incredible. Um, so conscious of time, there's a few more things I did want to um, ask you was just, first off, just, just we, we touched on it a little bit, but tell us a little bit, a bit more about your new book. The promo bit. Yeah, the promo. This is my new book. Yeah. Available. Yeah, let's get it. From bookshops now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, dude. Now, it's always yeah. good to talk about books. So I've got this new book, um, Lucid Dreaming, A Beginner's Guide to Becoming Conscious in Your Dreams. So this has come out only about a year and a half after my first book. Mm -hmm. And the first book, Dreams Awakening, was very much um, lucid dreaming within the context of Tibetan Buddhism and the spiritual path. You know, mm -hmm. it's a reasonably, you know, thorough book. Yeah. Um, and it's very personal to me. It's got my dreams in the back used to, to elucidate certain things in the book. Um, it goes into meditation, how to do walking meditation, seated meditation. It looks at parasomnia, sleepwalking, sleep talking, all this stuff. You know, it's a pretty thorough kind of guide to sleep and dream as well as the lucid dream stuff. Whereas the new one is very different. It's about half the length, only one little bit on Buddhism. Mm -hmm. This is for anyone who wants to learn to lucid dream. Yeah. Um, so much like what we were talking about earlier, saying that it's... It, it's very much, you know, this is the layman. It's nothing to do with yeah. Buddhism necessarily. It's just, exactly. yeah. Yeah, and it's got, I mean, all the techniques in here, you'll find in Dreams of Awakening, or most of them. But mm -hmm. here, they're in much more concise form. There's a whole chapter on stuff like food and drink for lucid dreaming, okay. aromatherapy for lucid dreaming, how the moon affects your lucid dreams. 
um, little sections on strange, strange but true, you know, funny facts about lucid dreaming. Yeah. My brief for it from Hay House was actually an idiot's guide. You know those things, yeah, idiot's yeah. guide, uh, dummy's guide. It's mm-hmm. a dummy's guide to lucid dreaming. Um, so it's really fun to do, actually, because it made me reflect on how can I get to the pith of this without watering it down at all, but how can mm-hmm. I get to the pith in five steps? Because everything's, you know, five steps to keeping a dream diary, five steps to falling asleep consciously, five steps of this. So it was really helpful for me to do. Um, and yeah, hopefully can, you know, be helpful to people. Excellent. Man. Um, so just, you, you've got your book. I know that you've, you've, you've spoken at, you know, lots of events. You do quite a lot of public speaking mm-hmm. and, and workshops and things like that. What, what have you got coming up in the next few months is there, you know, to share with the guys if people want to get out there and connect and get involved with what you're doing? Yeah, I've got next few months. I basically start touring again from this weekend, actually. I've okay. um, got uh, Istanbul and then I'll be in uh, Prague, Hungary, uh, Venice. So lots of basically lots of European stuff. So yeah. if anyone feels like a European break yeah. <laughs> on retreat, then lots of that. Yeah. Um, also, I'll have uh, my next kind of big project coming out will be in about a month. And that'll be the online course. Spent about, uh, probably about the last year actually working with these uh, really great filmmakers mm-hmm. from Awake Academy, which is a new online resource for um, techniques for how to wake up, whatever that may yeah. be. Online meditation mm-hmm. courses, lucid dreaming. And because they're filmmakers, it rather than being like a seven week online course, it's like seven short films that happen to have me teaching the camera, but also have animation, have little clips, little movie bits, yeah. really well kind of short, very high production values for an online course. So that cool. comes out soon. But anyway, I just have my website redone. So charliemorley.com, that's got loads of videos, loads of links, cool. you can buy the books, you can get the online courses, all that. So check that out for, for all the info. Definitely, and awesome. Um, so I'll, I'll obviously I'll put all the links up and, and stuff Brilliant. like that so people can uh, connect with you. But, um, you know, it's it's one of these things. There's so much that we can talk about. It's been it's been really fascinating. Just you know, exploring a tiny little fraction of this. But um, is there anything that you do as a kind of in the, for the people in the UK? Is there any thing that's like a kind of regular workshop you do, or anything that you do within your your sort of Tibetan practice that people can kind of just come up to if they're in London, for example, and just. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They could uh, come to the Dream Forum. So once a month, usually mm-hmm. on the first or second Sunday of the month, I have the Lucid Dream Forum, which is in Kennington. And that, again, the details will be on my website or on meetup.com. Yeah. And that's, you know, sometimes there are five people, sometimes there are 25 people. We sit around, drink tea and talk lucid dreaming. Um, so that's a regular thing. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, come and check out the Buddha Center I live if people are interested. Mm-hmm. From this year, in memory of one of our teachers who was murdered in, in uh, Tibet last year, all the courses are free this year. Wow. Um, so it's called Kagyu Semazon Buddha Center in Bermondsey. All the meditation courses are free. There's a cafe, there's cool stuff. And if I'm there, I'll gladly show them around. Uh, so let me know if they're popping down. Excellent, man. That's really cool. Um, loads more I'd like to talk to you about. But for today, I think we'll probably have to kind of wrap it up there. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show, man. And just, you know, thank you so much. Brilliant. It's been a pleasure to chat to you, man. Thank you, man. Thanks a lot. Cheers, dude.